Good afternoon. Is this all? Oh, my fault. Testing. Testing. One, two, three. Yeah, that's all. That's all. This is all. Okay. He says that. Yeah. Should be. Is the button pushed up? No. Are we okay now? We're good. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon. No pun intended, but I think it's the witching hour, so we'll yes. get started. My name is Jonathan Stair. I'm president of the, this organization, South Central Pennsylvania Genealogic Society. I'd like to welcome you to our November meeting. And is there anybody here for the first time? Can you tell us your name, where you're from, and what you're researching? What are you researching? Family name, topic? Family name is Rostep. Is that what you're researching? Are you researching your family? Oh. Okay, you're just going to hear Richard. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the to here today. At, th at this time, well, somebody else? Is it somebody else in the hand? Oh, this is me. So, just, and I'm just sitting around to do the story. Okay, and your name, sir, where are you from? York. Yeah. I'm Tim Snerger. Okay, welcome. Thanks. I'm always glad to have, have you on uh, faces, and I think this is a, be a very interesting topic. All right, next on the agenda will be Richard Robinstein reading the minutes from our last meeting. Uh, Minutes from the October 1st, 2023 meeting, which held here, Jonathan, President, introduced to uh, everyone. I was excuse me. To welcome those that were in attendance, asked if there were any new ones. There were three in attendance at that time. I read the minutes of last, uh, I read the minutes of August 27th, 2023. They were approved and will be submitted as Required. The August September 2023 Treasury report was given by Margaret Byrd um, that those will also be reported, are reported, and will be filed accordingly. Membership stood last month at 114, 19 life members, five family, nine new members, and a few have sent in their money, so the, not all the figures check right. Adam uh, gave the spotlight on any upcoming events for the month. Um, and also that just reminded everyone that uh, this is being recorded and you can look it on YouTube as well as Facebook if there's any questions for those that are out there. And, uh, on the way. Uh, Jonathan also encouraged becoming a member of uh, this our society as well as York History Center. Um, that just so you have access to more resources as library and archives. Uh, the History Center has a new facility, and the model of it was shown over there. The model's not there anymore this time. Uh, Jonathan applauded Ricky Einstein and the officer and the other members for contributing to the articles for the History Center Journal. Uh, since its inception, many of the members have contributed as well as the spokesman, Scott Mingus. Uh, gave a lot of material throughout the years without everyone access to different things. Adam mentioned the upcoming Oktoberfest, which will be probably be discussed a little bit more, and Vice President Kunkel gave a list of upcoming events. And then he also introduced the speaker Scott. Now for the reading of the Treasury report, Margaret. Thank you. Okay, for October 2023, balance September 
September 30th, 2023 was $16,010.69. Receipts for the month were membership renewals of $915, new members $70, donations of $50. So the, um, the PayPal, we through PayPal, we received two two-year membership renewals for um, a total of $116.42. Our fee was $3.58. Total receipts $1,051.42. Disbursements from Postal Connections for the September-October newsletter, $152.56. The October speaker fee was $125. Total disbursements of $277.56. The cash balance at October 31, 2023 was $16,884.55. Membership. Um, membership was exciting this month. We um, uh, are up to 134 memberships. We received um, one new family membership for two years, and that may, gives us a total of 10 new members for the year. And we ran a special through the website for memberships, a one-year membership, to, and we received 10 uh, new members there through that. Our, um, our renewals of nine members, uh, one was a life membership, which he um, uh, has been a member for several years and has now purchased a life membership. The four and four of the renewals are uh, renewed for two years, which is what we're really looking for. So they get a good, good feel for being with us for a couple of years at a time. We do have right now 25 two-year memberships that are running through to uh, 2026, 2022, I'm sorry, 2025. Um, we have 20 live members and we have 10 family memberships. And that's it. Hello, everybody. Just double checking to make sure it's, it's the right way. The very first time that I uh, I wasn't I wasn't running this for South Central, I was running it for the Civil War Roundtable, and I realized at the end that I never had the microphone plugged in. <laughs> uh, the people at home had the hardest time, uh, and it was Scott Minkus, fortunately, and he can project, you know, the ball stadium, but. Uh, which is a good thing, but uh, yeah, people had trouble, a little trouble at home. So just making sure this is fair, so should be good to go. Uh, my name is Adam Bentz, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Library and Archives. Always very happy to have um, South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society here. I uh, just, if you could bear with me, I'd like to go through a few upcoming events, uh, mostly for November, but also a few that are going into December, which is, of course, uh, busiest time of year for many people, but we have some interesting programming coming up. Uh, beginning on uh, beginning with second Saturday, which I think is a week from yesterday, um, obviously it's the 11th day of the 11th month, so we'll be uh, celebrating Veterans Day here with a scanning event, which is intended specifically for York County um, or nearby veterans. Um, we're asking people to register online and they're able to bring in uh, about five photos that document their service uh, or their life in the area. Um, and like I said, we're asking for pre-registration for that just to make sure we have time to, uh, to be able to scan photos with various veterans. Uh, so please check out our website for that. We will also be welcoming uh, York County veteran Sandra Kirst Stockton, who will be coming in to do a book signing uh, of her 480 Cadoras Street series, which is available in our bookshop. So that is a week from yesterday on uh, November 11th. Then on November 15th, I think that's two Wednesdays from now, uh, at 7 o'clock p.m., the York Civil War Roundtable will be here in this room, and uh, they will be welcoming Dr. Bradley Gottfried and his wife, Linda Gottfried, who will be discussing, very appropriately for November, Lincoln's immortal visit to Gettysburg. So please put that on your calendars if you're interested in that. 
Um, then on the 18th of November, everybody should know this uh, if, you're, if you're from York County, but it is Articles of Confederation Day, which we've been doing for many years. Um, and that will be taking place. It's kind of an all day event from 10 until 3 p.m. at the Colonial Complex, uh, which uh, is located at Market and uh, Pershing Avenue. So uh, please take a look at the website. There are loads of things going on all day, uh, which I can't repeat here, but please take a look at that. And uh, we will also have a number of original colonial era documents, including the original printing of the Articles of Confederation, which is the first constitution of the United States, which was adopted by Congress, the Continental Congress, while they were in York. Now, fortunately, it was first printed in Lancaster, but um, we, we can't control where there were printing presses at the time. So we will have uh, that and a number of other original documents at the Colonial Courthouse that day. So please check our website. Then moving into December, on December 13th, this is a library event. The Writers' Roundtable will be welcoming Don Leinball, who will be presenting That's All, Folks, The Rise and Fall of the Ramsey Theater, which, is in, which was in Stewartstown. Uh, the Writers' Roundtable takes place at 7 o'clock p.m., December 13th, which is, um, which should be Thursday, I believe. I thought I knew that. Uh, Writers is always is always Thursday night, but I'm looking at the next event, which is Spirits of the Past, and that's always a Friday night. So, okay. Can anybody tell me off the top of their heads? Christmas is Monday. So that'd be the 25th, 23rd, 22nd which would be the 15th. Okay, so I'm guessing that this date is probably December 14th for Writers' Roundtable, which would be the Thursday. Um, and then Friday, December 15th, is Spirits of the Past, which uh, we've been doing for two years now, uh, a little journey into uh, drinking history, um, and presented by our visitors, visitors Experience team. And uh, for December 15th, 7 o'clock p.m. in this room, they will be presenting a Charles Dickens Christmas. So that sounds like a very rum-based event, uh, but please register online in advance on our website. Uh, that's all I have, so thanks very much. I'll put a plug in for uh, Dr. Lionball's presentation of the Ramsey Theater. He did it down in Stewartstown, and it is a lot of fun. Great. Thank you, Richard and Margaret and Adam. I would like to thank all those who helped staff our table at the Oyster Festival. Uh, Mark Rickenberg, Richard Robinstein, Richard Tunkel was there, Erica uh, Lynn was there also. Tom was wandering around the facility, as was uh, Becky, and she was, you were helping with the Friends of Loving Cemetery too, right? So uh, we were well represented, and it was an interesting time. A couple of things to note. Last month, I reported the State Archives will open in November. Well, now I found out they're going to be opening in December. <laughs> uh, I got a VIP tour the last um, Wednesday of this month, and I think they're now looking at probably opening the first or second week in, in December. Just, just walk, watch your website for interesting going up there. Something Adam did not mention, if I'm correct, December 2nd will be the last day to do research here at the uh, History Center. And then the library will be closing to prepare for the move to the new facility. So if you have any research to do here uh, in the library, make sure you get in here before December the 2nd. This year, the board decided to try a different printer for our special publications, and hopefully in an effort to save money. And also uh, the new, new printer is Mass Talk. They will be mailing the special publications for us, which saves us having to um, stuff the envelopes and mail them ourselves. So we would be interested in any feedback from members whether or not you uh, like the new package that you get. If, if you get any problems with what you receive, uh, please let us know. So uh, if it works out, I think Margaret's going to tell me later, but I think we're saving money, right? We use yeah. mass talk. So that was one of our goals is to try to reduce our costs a little bit. Is there any other news before I introduce our speaker? Our speaker today is our vice president, Richard Kunkel, and uh, he wears many hats. For most of us, 
He's known as the ultimate resource on North County genealogy and history. And I just was somebody came in and had a question, Richard, which I referred to go see our vice president. He'll probably talk to you later. Uh, Richard's also a partner with the CGA law firm, and he plays the cello in the York Symphony Orchestra. He will be presenting today on the subject you see on the screen about uh, in, in particular witchcraft trial. But before he does that, he will um, just tell us a little bit about coming program. I do want to say two things. One is keep in mind we do not have a meeting in December, so our next meeting will be the first Sunday in January. And secondly, if we have to cancel a meeting because of weather, uh, please check our website or um, Facebook. what Facebook, Facebook, or or Facebook, or you can um, call me or Richard, right? Yeah. So uh, that that'll be our, our method methods of getting getting the word out. So Richard, if you come, tell us about future programs, and then tell us about. Uh, the case with Kat, Katarina Ziegler. Okay, so before I start today's presentation, I'll tell you about our future programs. January is, um, there we go. January is sort of a show and tell. So any of you can come if you have a research project that you're working on or an item that relates to your family or something along those lines, please come. Um, I think one of the last things I did was I baked the mincemeat pie and served it. So it would be kind of general. Um, and maybe I'll have leftover mincemeat and we'll, I'll bake another pie for those of you that partake in the mincemeat. So um, February is a program on um, African American history. It's Samantha Dorm, who I have to go to high school with. She's very active in the Lebanon Cemetery Association. And um, she's going to be talking about migrations of African American families that have associations with Dork so through slavery and that's up into the north here. Um, March is Lisa Wolfson, who will speak about the Welcome Society. That's the early Quaker settlement of Pennsylvania under William Penn. And um, look forward to that in March. April is still not percent finalized yet, so I will not announce that yet. May is an exciting trip off-site to the historic Conewago Chapel, which is an Irish town between sort of McSherry's town, Hanover, and New Oxford. Um, if you've never visited there, it's very well worth seeing. They've just done some extensive restoration to Conewago Chapel. Um, the, the actual building itself was built in 1785. It was probably the largest building at that time in this area, I would say. Just it's very large. And then it was decorated largely in the 19th century. There's frescoes on the ceiling. They've discovered frescoes on the walls, which through removing paint have been restored just recently. They also discovered a marble Italian altar, which has been restored. It was in a barn that was on the property, I guess, probably for about 100 years. So it um, should be very interesting to visit there. For people like me who've been to Germany and Italy and visited all these Catholic churches and so forth, this, if you've never traveled outside of the country, this is about the closest you're going to get to that. Um, in June, we have a Henry James Young Award. Um, so if you have anyone that you would like to nominate for that award, we will be voting on that um, in the winter uh, a couple months from now. But it's for people who have demonstrated excellence in the field of local history or genealogy. And it's um, a social event. Um, it's you, and that's held the second Sunday in June. It's not a first Sunday. These other ones are all first Sunday events. All right, so I'm going to do something a little different. Hopefully this works. I'm trying some multimedia. You're going to get a very short overture. But it's played. The piece called The Heirs of Alpergus Knot by Mendelssohn. It's significantly spooky, so that's why I'm playing it. So.
I'm not going to play the, the whole thing for you because it's rather lengthy. So, it's not working. Here, digging here. Here, digging. Access principles. That kind of Try now. Point to the projector. Down, 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 down the school. Yep, I'm doing it now. It fell on the floor, so hopefully it's not broken. Did he turn it off? No. Okay, there's an on and off switch. No. Well, it shouldn't be big if I where's it going. It's on. You know, we, we did try this. He did. It fell on the floor, so that is there a battery in to take the battery out with the battery then? What he just did. Oh, oh, good. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay. So this whole presentation is a result of me finding an article in the June 5th, 1829 version of the German uh, York Gazette. And it's a lengthy article. It covers about two pages. I believe this was an article that was probably paid for by the people that wrote it, which would be the lady Katerina Ziegler and probably some of her family. Um, it's on page, I believe, two and three. What the handout is actually a translation of that article, it's a complete translation. Not always easy reading to get through, um, but it's it's very, very odd piece. So this is the very beginning of them, on das Publikum, that means to the public. Um, grab my attention. I only found it uh, on newspapers.com because I was doing genealogical research and searching for a name in my ancestry, namely the Lau family of York County, L-A-U. And this came up from 1829 about a Michael Lau. I had an ancestor, Michael Lau. This is not my ancestor. This is his son. I descend from the brother. And I started reading it. And I was like, what is all this stuff about a hex and taunts and hex and meister, which means that like a warlock or a sorcerer and a witch's dance. And it was just, what is all this? It was just very odd. And so I copied it, and um, I have a German genealogist that I use, Sabina Schleicher. She lives in Munich, Germany, and she did a full translation. I've kind of worked with that translation a little bit to modernize some of the language, so it's a little easier to read. Um, but the actual article itself, it gives you a good picture, but there's some other things that you don't see. And at first, um, there's a lot of talk about a Sebastian Peller. I thought this must be someone who lives in York County. Turns out it is not. So my connection, since this is a genealogy society, my connection to the Lau family is through my mother's father, Clark Niebler, and his mother, who was a little bit pioneer. Her mother was Mary Jane Punkel, whose mother was Eve Lau. And Eve Lau's great uncle was Michael Lau in this article. And actually, for those of you who do a lot of research here at the library, there's many genealogies by Mike Lau, who no longer lives in the area, but he was here in New York. He was a direct descendant of this Michael Lau as well. So um, come across that name. Yes, they're related. Of course, I had to show pedigree. That's my great-grandmother's pedigree in the Lau family. As you can see, there's Mary Jane Funkel. And there's Peter Lau as her ancestor. Michael Lau is Peter Lau's brother. Peter was the oldest. He married a Renault. These people were all down in... They started out in West Manchester Township, Manchester Township, and then a lot in Cadoris, North Cadoris in that area. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that specifically about my great grandmother, because it seems as though maybe the apple didn't fall too far from the tree and believing in witchcraft and so forth. And growing up, I think one of the first big words I ever learned from my mother was superstitious. Because as a little kid, I was kind of fascinated by ghost stories and witches and all that kind of stuff, you know, the Halloween sort of thing. And then my grandfather, 
he was sort of, um, he probably had PTSD, but he was a compulsive talker and told lots of stories. He would tell these stories from his mother. His mother was not alive at that point, but he would tell these stories and it was always sort of, you know, you weren't really sure if he believed the story or not. You know, it was kind of left out there to hang in the open and you, you decide. Um, and he would talk a lot about witches in the Bible, the witch of Endor, for instance. He would say, oh, King Saul, and he went to the witch of Endor, and so on and so forth. And then it happened to have years later a client, I won't name any names, but he named his daughter Endora. Of course, Endora on Bewitched is the mother of the Samantha character on the sitcom from the 60s. And I think very deliberately she was named Endora after the witch of Endor to kind of fire in with the biblical thing, and I don't think my client realized that he was naming uh, his daughter after a, a witch, but at any rate, I'm going to tell you a couple stories. So that's my great-grandmother, and this is probably from the 1920s, and that's in front of the farmhouse on uh, Laurel Road, Chancellor Township, and I think that's maybe <laughs> Alberta is one of the daughters, probably her second oldest daughter, along with some turkeys and chickens and so forth. And I don't know, there's a car in the background there, you can just see it by the tree. I think I, I cropped it a little bit. I'm not sure if it's a Model A or a Model T Ford, something along those lines, but kind of a neat picture because the wind was blowing as they're dressed. And, uh, it's a pretty good picture for her. So yeah, um, it's still there. The house was torn down in the 1990s. Uh, the, and actually it was a uh, Israel Zarfoss, I think is the person who built the house. I can tie in my story about my grandfather being powwowed because Israel Zarfoss's son, George Zarfoss, who was an ancestor of David Hiley, who many of us know, was a powwow. And he lived further down Laurel Hollow. And my grandfather, probably about 1930, would have been nine, 10 years old. He was powwowed. They didn't think he was growing correctly. I think there's some disease that the Pennsylvania Dutch thought liver grown or something that your liver was binding your body together. It wasn't separating or something crazy. So his description of being powwowed by George Zarifos was he had to take off all his clothes and George Zarifos took a bone and ran it all over his body and did some kind of incant or you know some prayers or whatever it was. Powwow stuff. And supposedly he was pronounced cured. All right, so she always, she firmly believed in ghosts. And she was born in the month of December in 1891. My mother's younger aunt, who's 10 years older, was born in December 1956. And when my aunt was a little girl, my great-grandmother said to her, much to my grandmother's consternation, you're born in December, Amy. You can see ghosts just like I can. And of course, this is something that would terrify a small child. That my grandmother was really afraid that it would have nightmares forevermore about seeing ghosts. And her big story, and I never knew where this place was until just researching here. They always talk about the hate place. Um, John Heininger rented, he was a tenant farmer in some big farms. And this was a pretty big farm that was close to Lebanon Church in North Hopewell Township. This picture is off of a Cessna, it makes it look sufficiently spooky. Actually, the house, they probably fixed it up and it looks nice these days. I think they were kind of fixing it up when the picture was taken for assessment. You wouldn't take a picture of your house at quite that angle, it kind of looks like, but that's what assessment did at any rate. Um, she claimed that in this, this house was definitely haunted. And when she was a young girl, probably a young teen, um, she was awakened in the night with a little man beside her bed with a long white beard. And um, that's just recounting that. Apparently, this is the thing. I find that kind of terrifying when the ghost would come and stand right beside your bed while you're asleep. But um, this was her story that the little man with the long white beard, this doesn't have a long white beard, but sufficiently spooky. Okay. So her first two children were born fairly close together, and then they didn't have some children for a while. And that's another story which I won't get into. Um, so when the, she was pregnant with the second child, um, there was a Jewish peddler came by. Now, today, we do not have Jewish peddlers that wander the countryside or come to your house, nor do we have gypsies that wander around and try to sell things. But in 1910, you did. And 
peddler came and she didn't want to buy anything. And I guess he got nasty with her and she got nasty with him and cussed him out. And as soon as she did it, she regretted it because she knew that he had cursed her. And the peddler had one bad eye. And so the, the child was born with one bad eye. I've seen this, the man before I was 16. He did. He, one eye was useless. Um, but she was convinced that's what happened and that's what caused it, that it was a curse. Now that's a 19th century view of a, a peddler. So it says, um, what are you selling basically? It's like tea kettles and strainers and kettles of some sort. And, and they look a little small for that. It could be. Could be the strain broth, though, too, is what I was thinking. You know, in um, English history, they claim it was a bed warmer that they smuggled a baby in. That's too small for that. Oh, uh, then she talked about a certain Mrs. Reifinger, whose mother happened to be a bird, um, who she thought she was a witch. She was going around people's houses. She lived very long, what's now Route 74. And, she thought she was casting spells around the houses of others. She was convinced of this. Um, I said, was she really just singeing a chicken for Sunday dinner? You know, if you actually butchering chickens looks like pretty um, human sacrifice or something, you know, it's a pretty bloody mess. But she was convinced she was casting spells. There's a picture. Of course, we all, many of us know probably from school, um, Macbeth and the Three Witches. Of course, William Shakespeare was no dumb person. William Shakespeare wrote that play after James VI of Scotland became James I of England, then King James, who had the Bible translated. But he also wrote a book about witchcraft. Um, so Shakespeare made the play about Scotland, and James I's ancestors are the good guys in the play. And also he had witches, which would have really been uh, a draw for King James because he wrote treatises on witchcraft. And of course, throughout the 1600s, that's really the heyday of persecution of witches throughout Europe. Um, especially, you know, in Germany it was a big thing, but also in the British Isles. Of course, our famous example where it leaked over here was the Salem Witch Trials in the 1690s. Then there was, I just had to tell this story, but it's very incomplete. And no one seems to remember it except me. So um, there was a sick child. It's not a relative. It's someone else that lived down in the country. I'm convinced that the child died, but I'm not 100% sure about that. And kind of maybe there's a famous poem in a song uh, that Goethe and, and um, Schubert did called the Errol König, which means the word Elf King, where there's a sick child that dies. So it's, if the sick child and something bad happens, it's usually the child dies. But they claimed that if the child was sick and it became light as day outside, and the chariot came down and, and took the child away. Child, I don't think the body, but the spirit, I guess. Of course, that refers a lot to the story of the prophet Elijah, who was um, bodily taken up into the heavens by a fiery chariot with fiery horses. Actually, the movie, movie Chariots of Fire, I think that comes sort of from that with actually the, his successor, the guy standing there, the prophet Elisha. There's also, I just have to tell a brief digression about the prophet Elisha. Henry Young, who uh, our award is named after, when he was young, he often attended services at St. John's Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. And because they preached in German, he was practicing on his German up until World War II, they preached in German at that church. And apparently in the lectionary at that point in time, there was a lesson from the Old Testament about the prophet Elisha, where some boys went and made fun of the prophet Elisha and said, hey, you old old head or something along those lines. Well, God went and he did smite those boys. He had some wild animals, I don't know if they were lions, Something along with they got eaten at any rate. Um, and there's some paintings about this. This is totally out of the lectionary at this point in time. But Henry Young remembered that the, um, the pastor who was preaching in German said it served them right for criticizing and making fun of the prophet of the Lord. So that was the, the message for that Sunday. Not quite the message we get today when we hear a sermon on Sunday. But um, I wish someone else would know what this story was. I'd like to hear the rest of it or get the right facts because 
it's it's not really a family story, but my grandfather told it several times and doesn't quite figure out. There's another story that has nothing to do with witchcraft. Um, it has to do with um, the short for piles of turpentine. I won't get into that. So apparently if you take this cure once, you will never do it again. You're cured forever. Um, so on my other side of my family, on my father's side, um, this is my great, great grandmother. She was basically what we call powwow. Um, and her ancestors were from neighboring villages, basically in, uh, in Southwestern Germany to where many of Elizabeth Heining or Eagler's ancestors were from. Except this family was Catholic. Um, they lived in the territories of Prince Bishop of Speyer. And most of uh, my great grandmother Eagler's are in Palatine territories that later became part of Baden. So she became proper in, it's the German term. They wouldn't use powwow in Germany or in Ukraine. But her father, who died of tuberculosis before she was born, she was born after he died. He was also supposedly had these powers to heal people. And so there's a big thing with the powwow tradition that if you must obtain it from someone of the opposite sex. So it was assumed the moment she was born that she had these powers from him because um, she was his only child and she was a female. And she apparently practiced these powers during her lifetime. Her granddaughter, who's my grandmother, I sort of think she thought she had some of these powers as well. And some of these same superstitions about witchcraft and all that stuff, she seemed to believe as well. Um, a brief story, um, all the parties are no longer living now. My grandmother was very big into um, flowers and plants and gardening. And um, she had a neighbor who's also deceased now. And um, most of you are probably um, aware of the show Keeping Up Appearances and the character of Hyacinth Bouquet. Well, my grandmother always thought that, that her neighbor was like Hyacinth, and actually I think my grandmother was a good bit like Hyacinth also. And I think we all have a little bit of inner Hyacinth as we admit it. We just need it. It's, it's identifying it. That's the hard part. But at any rate, her neighbor came over and she had uh, one of these mandevilla vines, which are fairly expensive thing. It's called, and it's named after Alice Dupont. I think they were developed at Longwood. And um, she was quite proud of this. And the neighbor lady went and admired the, vine, the plant. And then after the neighbor lady admired it, it died. And so she, my grandmother said she was jealous of that plant. So she put a curse on it and she killed it. Now, more likely, more likely she overwatered it is my guess, but she was convinced that the neighbor lady was a witch and she cursed the plant. My mother was just totally mortified and horrified and she better. At any rate, this exists into the 20th century, maybe even to the 21st. It's just knowing where to find it. All right, so now to the article, the cast of characters. First, we have Katerina Ziegler. Her maiden name was Epley, and she was born in 1770, um, and I have her baptism from St. Jacob's Stone Church. She probably lived closer to what's now Ziegler's church, but that church did not open until 1771. And actually, her father, uh, Jacob Epley, lived um, close to the Ziegler family, so it makes sense why she married into that family. They had adjoining land. And they would have lived somewhere a little bit west of um, Seven Valleys, probably in North Medoras Township. Um, interestingly, she was born on December the 25th, so did she see ghosts? Um, and I've, I've tried to look this up about this December, being born in December and having powers of seeing ghosts. I've never found anything about it. I don't know if it was just unique to my great-grandmother or what, but she firmly believed in it. Oops, going the wrong way. Here we go. This is her tombstone, which is at Ziegler's Church. Um, and basically, it's a translation. Here rests the body of Katerina Ziegler, born in Epley, born 25th of December, 1770, and died 28th of February, 1834. Fallen German gives her maiden name. It's a very nice tombstone to have that. 
This is her husband, Johannes or John Ziegler. Actually, the Ziegler name is fairly common in Germany. It means tile maker. Um, so uh, it's an, actually it's an occupational name. Ziegler is a tile maker. And if you've been to Germany, most of the roofs in Germany are made out of uh, terracotta tiles. Um, so there was a, a big demand for that sort of thing. Um, he was the son of Barnett Ziegler. He's the guy that either sold or gave the land for Ziegler's church. Um, and his wife was Rosina Euler. They were married on the 23rd of November, 1790 at St. Matthew's in Hanover. And interestingly, they only had two children, which for that time period is not a lot of, a lot of children. Now, this is his tombstone. He outlived her by about nine years. And interestingly, that tombstone is in English, not in German, like the wife's was. Also named in the article was one of their children who was living with the Lau family. And um, the other child was John Epley Ziegler. And then this is Maria Katharina, or they call her Ket, which is a nickname I never heard, kind of similar to Kate, or she was probably later known just as Catherine. This is her tombstone, which I don't think exists anymore. Does anyone know, was Wolf Cemetery badly vandalized a while back? She's buried at Wolf's Church in West Manchester Township. Parent is the, it seems like a lot of people there have new tombstones, and they, a lot of them have really erroneous information on them. She was born around 1809, um, and the new tombstone says she's born in 1825. Totally off. All right. Then one of the people that she really goes after in her article that she published is Sebastian Keller. And first I started looking in your county for Sebastian Keller, figuring this guy must be close by. Well, he's not. He lived in Racco Township, Lancaster County, which is not real close. It's across the river. Now, Racco Township is a real long township stretches down almost to around Marietta, but also goes up to the Lebanon County line. And I don't think it was ever divided. Um, the Chicky Salunga Creek is one of the borders and you know, that empties just below Marietta into the Susquehanna. So it comes down that far. Um, not quite sure where he lived exactly, but this is a copy of the beginning of his will. And he died in 1839. He was born in 1766. In um, his will, he does not mention a wife. He only mentions two children, but I think we have him because he talks about willing to his son. He says he, um, all right. I give and devise unto my son, Sebastian, all my books and all my medicine bottles, jars, glasses, and everything belonging to my medical shop or profession, and one horse creature, his choice, if I shall have any left at my decease. Likewise, my plantation. He only had two children as well in his will. Um, so was he a doctor? Well, if you read the article from Katharina Ziegler, I think she thinks he's a big quack, okay? Um, she didn't think too much of his medicine or what it was. And the Lau family say Keller's stuff won't work if so-and-so's here. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So I, I think at that point in time, his father was said to be a doctor as well. He was also a Sebastian Keller, and he died in 1808 in the same area. He was born in Switzerland about 1740s. Um, whether he had any medical training of any sort is sort of dubious. Um, I've run across different people who are referred to as doctors. Oftentimes, I think they probably were powwows, um, especially in the Pennsylvania Dutch region. Um, my other grandmother, her maiden name is Shaw, and the earliest ancestor was in Baltimore County, Maryland. The Maryland branch of that family he was definitely born in Germany. They said he was born in England and was a doctor. He was not a doctor. 
that I can tell, but he may have been a powwow. His daughter-in-law, who is the daughter, the wife, the son who moved here to York County, Baltimore County, she is referred to in the biography of a grandson, um, Joseph Wise, who moved to Joe Davies County, Illinois, he knew Ulysses S. Grant, he says his grandmother was a doctress and she made sufficient money to send him to school. It was before the public school um, legislation that came through in Pennsylvania. So I think she was a powwow as well. Um, you don't hear of doctresses and so forth at that time period. All right, a little bit about the Michael Lau family. Now, Lau is an old version of the German word for lion. Today, the word is Lova, and sometimes you'll see Lau, L-O-W, but this is an old version of that, it means lion. These are some of these new tomb tombstones. They're at Wolf's Church, and actually they have the wrong birth date for him. He's born in 1771, not 1770. They look brand new, they look like they're granite. I think they must have had some, some vandalism or something and they replaced things, but they didn't do very good research. Okay, so these are his ancestors, which are also ancestors of mine. His ancestry is all Alsatian, although there's some Swiss in it as well. They came to Alsace before they came to America. So um, his mother was a Ness, and um, the Fry would be Swiss, but they came to Alsace first. And the Ness family, they're Alsatian as well, and came to York County in an early date. And this very well could be the house where that family lived. I don't know when this house was built. This was in the newspaper. Um, this is would have been the property that the first Michael Lau inherited, and then this Michael Lau also inherited this property. There was a property from the original immigrant where there was an interesting vaulted cellar, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers did a study of it. It's very European style. Um, so it's sort of near Bear Station. There's a, I don't know where Potato Town is. I'm not quite familiar with that, but that's where they're saying this is. That was published in the New York Daily Record. And they're saying the house was torn down in the 1960s. Okay, so here was the big surprise I found. Being a genealogist is how I found it. The Ziegler's daughter, Kat or Katarina or Catherine, was married to the Lyle son. And that's not evident that she, she talks a lot about the daughter and that she's living there. I assumed at first that she was a domestic servant or something along those lines. It didn't make sense why she was there. Makes sense. She was married to the son of the Lau couple. So some of this is more, you know, the, the in-laws aren't getting along is what some of it is. That was a big surprise for me. Also, the daughter being only one of two children, and she was quite young, she was probably about 18 years old when she went there, um, she might not have been quite used to living in such a large family and so forth. So I don't quite know what all the dynamics were, but that's probably part of the problem that caused these accusations. So what were the accusations? Well, the biggest one that sticks out like a sore thumb is that she told people, particularly just the Lau family and apparently no one else, that she told them she went to York and next to the road she saw a dance and went there and joined the dance. And it was a witch's dance, which in German is Hexenkanz. And the fiddle player was clad in red. Now, who do you think the fiddle player clad in red would be? The devil. The devil, that's right. She was dancing with the devil. I can bring my joke in now because you go to a Baptist church. So why are the Baptists against fornication? Because it leads to dancing. <laughs> And for the Hexen Tons, that would be the original dirty dancing, if there ever was, <laughs> dancing with the devil. So these other ones are not quite as serious. That's a really serious one. Um, but when someone gave medicine to his daughter, she would know what it was and when it was given to her. So it's obviously the thing where she's not there, but she knows what's going on. 
And the other one that someone talked about her on Wednesdays and Fridays, she didn't know it even if she was not present. Pretty typical. Um, we're going to talk about Patrick Donmoyer's book a little bit towards the end. He has some stuff about this. A lot of it has to do with um, stealing milk and cream through using rags. They would have something, a witch would have it in her house, and all the milk would come into her bucket, and the bucket of the person who milked the cow would go dry. Um, things like that. Salem witch trials, you know, they said that they caused them physical pain and attacked them in the night. Um, occasionally, I, I actually just had a cramp in my calf um, at night one week, uh, one night, I think it was last week. And I remember getting the first one when I was a teenager. I thought, this is why people thought of their witches when it feels like someone's tying a knot in your leg that would feel like someone put a, a hex on you and cause that to happen. Now, we, we know that's not true. In the middle of the night when you're awakened by something like that, it's highly unpleasant. All right, so most of us, our image of a witch is the Wicked Witch of the West. So we want to play a little clip from The Wizard of Oz. Actually, my grandmother, Evler, I think she was on a school trip in 1940 in Washington, D.C., and this entrance of the witch, she said there were a bunch of kids in that theater and they were all screaming and crying and going hysterical because of this witch. So stay calm, it's, it's not real. You've probably all seen it already. So it's not smart enough to cut right to the witch, so we have to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh. Tried to get fancy with the technology. What's your oldest Keller uh, ancestor? I don't descend from Kellers. Oh, that's all that's the other. I don't want to descend from enemies. Quack. You St. John's uh, first book of Jerk for St. John's. They still do Christmas, a German Christmas service. They do. Anybody did. <laughs> we did have a scenario. Yes, we did. Here, while it's on that, I'll play another little piece of music. But there are some pieces of music that deal with which is Sabbath, which is dances, one of the most famous, and I'll play a little bit of it for you, Night on the Bald Mountain by Missouri Steve. Actually used in the movie The Witch Wizard of Oz um, at the Witch's Castle. All that swirling around is supposed to be the witches coming in on their brooms. Certain dates in the calendar which are associated with which is getting together. And the night on Bold Mountain is based on St. John Eve. It's going to be Midsummer's Night, Feast of John the Baptist. Hey, we're filling it in with other technology, right? Yeah. Oh, this presentation. <laughs> All right, I'll play another snippet. Here. Okay, let's play this. About a minute and a half until we get to the fish. So get to hear the lullaby league and the lollipop guild.
You know, those were real flames. She got burned. <laughs> Okay, so the Wicked Witch of the West, it's probably our concept of a Wicked Witch from that movie. Very European, though. She's got the broom, she's got the pointed hat, and um, she's considered, I think, in movies to be one of the worst villains. Um, she never has anything nice to say. There's not really any redeeming quality about her in that movie. She's always blaming someone else. She doesn't just want to get Dorothy. She wants to get her dog as well. I mean, pretty bad. So, and she's just pure nastiness. So that's that's the Wicked Witch. That's sort of our concept, but it's actually a very European vision of Wicked Witch. So the Texan Tons, um, this was actually in a Philadelphia publication. It's actually a, a, it's from 1790s. Um, Patrick Dunmore used his book and it kind of captures what they would have thought about uh, this was. Uh, this, this whole thing about her seeing a dance along the road while she's going to York. For some reason, I keep picturing coming out of Seven Valleys and coming up, what I think of the Bulls Church Road or something right there. But like, you would not see a witch's dance alongside the road. It's just weird. Okay. Um, just doesn't happen. The devil there and people dancing around when you decide to go join it. Very, very, very odd. Um, so, the Night on Bold Mountain is, is one of the artistic depictions of that sort of thing. Another one, and I'll just briefly play a little bit of that, is Dance Macabre. Hope we don't want to talk now from Samson to Delar one. Here we go, this should work. Start so. What does the devil play? Now, this is a very French text and tongue.
too much debt. One more little piece. Get it? Oh, the totem talks. Dance of death. It uses the well. <laughs> I got less, but I got the wrong one. Technology works beautifully. Oh, okay, here we go. It's the DA theory. That's part of the Latin Requiem Mass. It means the day of wrath. Little happy peace. This is by Kron Felicity. He was sort of the first big superstar. Women were throwing themselves at him. All right, I want to play this. So the eve of the 1st of May is called Valpurgis Knot. And the 1st of May is one of these things. It's between the equinox and the solstice. So probably in pagan religion was a time for celebrating fertility or something of that sort. So in the Harz region of Germany, this is a big tourist thing at this point. Um, they celebrate it. It's kind of like Halloween is here. And it's a very more modern witch's dance, but they, they do this for the tourists. So we have a little video of this. These are all middle aged German housewives. It was sort of fun. I can't really understand the words, but I think there's that sugar and bacon. Sugar, sugar is English, sugar in German. Sounds like sugar and speck, speck with the bacon.
That reminds me of the Bunker Raider for some reason, too. I know it's a tourist thing, but back so long ago, if you were accused of that, she would have been in Europe in the 1600s. She probably would have ended up getting burned at the stake. So um, now in your article that you have, I think it might be on the second page. This is actually um, what she, her, a bunch of her neighbors went and said that, you know, she's not a witch. And they said, because the enemies of Katarina Ziegler want to give her a blasphemous, dishonorable, bad reputation, we, the underside, as well, testified to her good reputation that she was born of honest and honorable parents and was accepted into the Lutheran community by baptism and the Lord's Supper, and that she and her husband, Johannes Bigler, are still honorable community members of St. Paul's Church, St. Bigler's Church. Katharina Ziegler has a good reputation and name according to Christian order and neighborly customs. So they're saying she's an honorable person, she's not someone that courts with the devil and, and attends witches dances such things and there's a whole list of people who it's like three justices of the peace one of them was a deputy surveyor for the county of york um daniel or mr lease i believe um so these are upstanding people in the community that are coming to her defense and then further testimony, Michael Benz and others pulling out lies about the daughter by old Michael Lau and his son, Johannes. Um, message from her husband, Johannes Ziegler directly to Michael Lau and his son, Johannes, regarding their lies about his wife being part of the Hexentons. Testimony of various individuals who lived in the Ziegler household that they never heard Katharina Ziegler say anything about seeing Hexentons. Now, I think it's interesting they had all these people in their household, and I think that's because they only had two children and one boy. Um, most families, at least most of my ancestors, they had like 10 kids. So they had plenty of uh, people to work their farm, and the Ziglers were fairly well-to-do people, as were the Laos, um, had large, large farms, but they only had one, two children. So I think these people lived there to help out. Um, and then there's a long list of neighbors giving testimony that Katharina Ziegler is a woman who always showed a good moral conduct. Now, I think she must have been of a very strong character. Um, she wasn't putting up with this. And she actually went and got on a horse by herself and rode to Lancaster County. Now, I have no idea how long that would have taken from Seven Valleys to Rappo Township, Lancaster County. Um, apparently, um, Sebastian Keller went and said that she had a poor creature of a horse that he was pitying her horse, but the horse probably was tired if it went that far. Um, so she went there and she confronted him. Of course, you didn't call ahead at that point in time. Apparently, he wasn't a witch enough to know that, um, that she was coming. Although she calls him, it's interesting, she kind of disavows witchcraft and says it's nonsense, but she calls him a sorcerer or a hexenmeister many times. Um, that's how she refers to him in her article. Um, yeah, I think she told him off, but good. So um, she wasn't happy about it because he had published things about her, and that's why this article came about. Unfortunately, those articles do not survive. And then at her end, she talks about some things. Apparently, he did make a comment to her that she's just lucky she wasn't burned at the stake for being a witch. And she told him that this was nonsense. And um, she kind of says that the United States is a more enlightened place and that no one, is, this hasn't happened to anyone for quite some time. And my genealogist friend, Spina Schleicher, one of her big studies actually was cases of people being persecuted for witchcraft. And she said, oh, late 1600s was probably the last that they persecuted someone 
the late 1700s, I should say. So not less than 50 years before this happened. I found this interesting. I could not find this anywhere else. Um, it's at the end of the article, and it seems very modern. She calls it the 11th commandment. When you Google the 11th commandment, the only thing you can come up with is Ronald Reagan says you shouldn't talk bad about another Republican. That obviously isn't happening right now. So, uh, but her very modern. Leave everyone be who he is, so you will stay who you are. Very interesting. Yeah. Also, I sort of imagine, uh, I never saw the movie, but I remember seeing clips for it, Mel Brooks, The History of the World, or whatever, and he's Moses coming down, he's the 15 commandments, one of them falls off and breaks his thumb, the 10 commandments. So just on that, that part that fell off and broke on the ground, I don't know. Of course, you know, most Christians would say the 11th commandment is what Jesus gave to the apostles about loving. So this sort of is, it's very different though. It's not what you expect. What's the significance? Well, it reveals attitudes and beliefs in your county, which I think were kind of universal, um, at least among the Pennsylvania Germans. And it's just they don't break through that all. It's highly unusual to find something like this appear in the press. Usually, newspapers at that time were legal notices, advertisements for the sale of a farm, um, you know, political news, not this. And, you know, if it was the York newspaper company of the day and you wanted to publish this, it would probably be about $10,000 to do it. Um, it's so expensive to put anything like that in. I assume they probably paid for it, but I think they had the money to do it. And then the other thing is, it's almost exactly 100 years before the Hex murder of Nelson Raymar, which is a similar sort of story. I mean, Nelson Raymar was a powwow and... Uh, John Blymeyer was also a foul well, but not a very good one, apparently. And he talked two other guys into saying that Nelson Raymeyer had hexed three of them, and they went down to Raymeyer's Hollow and murdered him in his house right before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, we visited there a number of years ago. Actually, I have, I have tentative connections with a number of the parties there. I've represented a descendant of Nelson Raymeyer. Also, my grandparents played cards with a relative of the Curry guy, and I work with a close relative of the Blymeyer. Tested for one I don't have any connection with, at least that I know of. But um, that brought international attention to your county. Of course, that is a picture of Nelson Raymeyer's house right after the murder. That's why all those cars were there down in Raymeyer's Hollow, which is actually just a hop, skip, and a jump away from 83. Um, you're really close there. You could walk from 83 from Hangtown, where the church is in Hangtown, if you cross 83 going east. Raymar Hollow is right there. Seems very isolated, but it's really not that far from things. And that brought international attention to your county because of that. And that was very swift. He was murdered in November. The trials were in January. <laughs> Three trials. Of course, the expert on that, if you want to know all about that. I think the book's probably for sale. Ross McGinnis, he's 95 years old now. He got all the transcripts of the trials. He knew a lot of the people, met them, searched them out. He was the one who gave this presentation about 20 years ago down at the Nelson Raymar house when we met there. And then for further reading, I really suggest this book. He's done an excellent job. I'd love to have him as a speaker. Instead, you got me. But I wanted to get this story out there. Um, I thought about writing an article, but the actual article, you almost have to reproduce the article that was there, and it's many pages long. So I thought this was a good means of getting this story out there. And Katarina Ziegler was not a witch, okay? <laughs> Definitely not. She, I think, was a very interesting lady. She probably, I think, has descendants here in York County. She had, um, her daughter had two daughters that I know of with George Lau. One of them married a bear, and another one married an eyster. And actually, one of the daughters, her obituary appears in the parish telephone that Margaret Burke did. And they said, what a wonderful, fine person she was. That would be a granddaughter of Katarina Ziegler. So, any questions? Yes. I don't think so. 
I think maybe their Wolf's Church has a bunch that's in West Manchester Township. Well, they're the, the immigrant who came from Alsace, his original tombstone is in East Berlin. That's some business. Someone yanked it out of the ground. Yeah, there's a replacement stone there, a big one that they put up in 1932, which would have been the 200th anniversary of the family coming to America. Sometimes that happens. The origin of the name Keller, and do you know who Keller means cellar, so, basement. Do you know Sebastian's grandfather? And I were... just know his father, supposedly from Switzerland, is what it says. That's a common name. It just, it probably, like um, in German towns, you eat the Ross Keller, that means it's the, the basement of the city hall. The, the, the Roth is the, the, the council. And um, well, and you know what they kept in the cellar, they kept the beer and the wine and all that stuff. So interesting, Laura. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Our meeting is adjourned. So they're never